have the pleasure to have with us uh, Egyptologist Samir Abbas, and I think he will tell us a lot about Alexandria. First of all, good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Samir. First, uh, can you shed light on this era of the Greco Greco uh, Roman era and how uh, did Alexandria look like at uh, this period? Sure. You know, I, I like so much the way you introduced Alexandria as a beautiful city. This is really a beautiful city. I had the chance to live a very important part of my life in Alexandria and uh, I'm really enjoyed the time I spent and the uh, life I spent in Alexandria. So when I come to Alexandria, it, is, it has a unique character when I come to Egypt. Egypt is known as known for the ancient Egyptian civilization, uh, the ancient Nile yes. Valley civilization. But Alexandria has is mainly Greek and Roman history there. It is not a way to say that the ancient Egyptians, you know, they don't have any contribution to the ancient city. No, so the city was found, was found originally by the ancient Egyptians as early as Ramesses II and Seti I, his father. We have, uh, we have monuments in Alexandria, not as much, but we have some evidence to prove that Alexandria is, dates back to the ancient Egyptian time, not to the Greek and Roman, as we think, but the ancient city, as we know, and the name of the city, Alexandria, that's named after Alexander. And that is, that is the important part of the history we are talking about. And Alex that was built around the 4th century BC. And Alexander itself, he was one of the very controversial character in the ancient history of mankind. A very young uh, military uh, leader. He, was, he became the king of Macedonia and, and Greek as well, shortly after the death or the assassination of his father, Philip. And uh, he left, uh, the father left behind a very strong army and a very ambitious and a very young, well-educated leader, which is Alexander. So he led the Greek and Macedonian army in non-stop campaign for more than 10 years until he died. He died so young, around in his early 30s. And when he made it to Egypt, so he wanted to found a new city and the new city to carry his name. And he wanted for some important reason, he wanted this city, which is in Egypt, to be the biggest of his achievements and to be one of the most beautiful cities of, ancient, of the ancient world. And it became. So just talking about Alexandria, for example, there are certain places that we have to talk about. Well, of course, we can talk about uh, antiquities underwater, the discovered um, monuments and all of this. But the most attracting part, actually, for me is Kumishwet. So, you know, first of all, I'm really impressed, you know, because when you made to Alexandria, you made sure that you stop by some of the historical attractions, not only visiting the beaches, like most of the people do it. Because uh, Kumishwet, uh, I have, uh, if I'll choose one location, one site from ancient Alexandria, which I like it most, it would be Kumishwet. Even it is a small site, but it is unique. There is nothing like, hardly anything like that in Egypt. It is a deep shaft lead to a catacomb style of tombs, which is a Roman style. And the most important thing is uh, uh, a tomb, that's like, that's like a, a new theory, could be the lost tomb of Cleopatra and Mark Antony. So Cleopatra is very well known all over the world. And just by introducing Komushoeva as the lost tomb of Cleopatra and Mark Antony that helped greatly to to attract light and to put a spot of light on the history of ancient Alexandria. It is a unique tomb and it was started for a royal family. Uh, I think and gradually I'm getting believing that in the days for Cleopatra and Mark Antony and uh, Ptolemy the 15th or Caesarian, which is her son from Julius Caesar, and later on became a public burial place by the Romans when the Romans took over Egypt. Not only Komushaeva actually, which is an important. So we also have another famous attraction, unique all over the world, called the ancient lighthouse of Alexandria. It is not standing anymore, but it is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And it's, it collapsed, you know, by earthquakes and a big tsunami. You know, that's uh, the, uh, the photo we have it now, or the illustration is for Alexander, the young Macedonian leader who led uh, his father's army and conquered Egypt. And when it comes to Alexander, it's, I was also happy that you haven't added the word the great after his name, because we cannot we cannot name a leader as a great leader after invading our country. So the only thing which made him great is that he paid very well for Greek historians to write down the history from, from his perspective and to show him as great. So that's, that's one of those uh, photos of showing uh, cosmopolitan Alexandria that was in 1900 and that was even until that time it was one of the most beautiful cities 
in the whole world it, in, in, until that time. So that's an important one, which is showing showing the ancient uh, urban landscape of Alexandria. It was unique. It was one of the most advanced like city landscape in that time. We are talking about a landscape has been made 2000, almost 2,300 years ago. It was designed like a chessboard, you know, and here you can see an island, the island known as the Forest Island, connected with the lands with a hepta stadium or a sort of a causeway and for creating two harbors and on the island that is a, that's the main island, that was Alexander's idea to connect the island with the land. And on the small island, the forest, they built the lighthouse, which is, took the same name, which is forest. That's what we see right now. So the ancient lighthouse of Alexandria was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was a hundred, more than 120 meter height, which is like a skyscraper today, but that was built 2000, 2200. Uh, 60 years ago. So the importance of this, uh, just talking a practical way of how we can use this history and what we know to attract attention to Alexandria. Like, like the project of the new library of Alexandria. So that was the revive of the rule of the ancient library that was built to remind the people with the fame of the ancient library so, so that we can build a civilization again based on that. I, I call for another project of rebuilding the ancient lighthouse of Alexandria and using many of the original building material. There is more than 2,000 blocks of stones remaining from the ancient lighthouse of Alexandria after the destruction lies under the water and which is called the sunken antiquities. That's another reason to attract attention to Alexandria. So there is a sphinxes, you know, under the water. There is granite pillars, there is obelisks, there is hieroglyphics, uh, walls and, and tablets with hieroglyphics. There is big closes and statues of Greek and Roman rulers under the water there. So we can build an underwater museum where people they can go and watch the underwater. There is, I, I know, I know, I know there is some divers which is ego and, uh, and visit this underwater museum, but it is not very common at all. Just attracting the attention to that, that's helped to bring tourism back to Alexandria. Roughly speaking, is one out of 100 tourists will make it to Egypt, will make it to Alexandria, which is not fair. It is only two and a half hour driving from I Cairo. think we need to promote more for all these monuments because when people go to Alexandria, they only go to enjoy the beach. Exactly. So how can we make more promotions for uh, this big museum in Alexandria? So um, I will use an example. The example of the, is the ancient, sorry, the new library of Alexandria, which is public Yes. Um, I, because I grew up watching this library being built. I was studying in the university across the street yes. from, from the library. and. Before the project, before even putting the foundation, they have a great propaganda machine all over the world of the importance and the role of the new library. Now, if any tourist who make it to Alexandria, the first thing he wants to stop at is an, not the catacomb, not Pompey's pillar, not the Roman amphitheater, which is as old as 2,000 years old, roughly speaking. No, he wants to go and see the new library of Alexandria. So it is all about propaganda and promotions. And we can copy what the, what the director of the uh, new library did and to apply that to other projects, like the ancient lighthouse, like the underwater museum. Mm -hmm. If we manage to do that, that will attract Big lots campaigns. of interest. So we have, a, we yes. have already a good experience. We have uh, something which is worked out. We just need to study that, develop it, and apply it again on another project. And that's how we can attract the attention. Talking about other sites that one can promote for in Alexandria, definitely you have many important sites. I, I will, for example, the Roman amphitheater. You know, so Alexandria has a famous train station, which is the main train station. Uh, when you get off the, the train there, just three minutes walking, no more. Three minutes walking across the street from the train station, you have one of the most important excavated sites from ancient Alexandria. When you go there, it is packed with historical buildings, an amphitheater or a theater in a smaller scale, not in a big scale, a big uh, public bathhouse, which is uh, unique and the only one of its kind found in Alexandria so far, and a streets, ancient Greek and Roman streets, houses uh, tiled with mosaics. That was all just across the street from the train station. So, the inter so there was, it was only because of coincidence this site has been survived, mm. which is mean that ancient Alexandria is still buried underneath. And what is proving that is the Roman theater and Pompey's pillar and some sites like that. So, but it is buried underneath the downtown or the central city of Alexandria now, which is not a big part, by the way, you know, compared to the, the size of the city now, the central part is a very small part. So which is mean that 
we can bring ancient Alexandria back again. So I have been to many other Greek cities around the world, you know, seeing like in Jaras in Jordan, amazing, huge scale buildings, very well preserved, and Ephesus in Turkey, and they have an amazing, but the interesting thing that Alexandria used to be much more famous, mm -hmm. much more important, much more rich than these cities, which is mean that. So underneath downtown Alexandria now, if we manage to find a way in the long-term project, to excavate downtown Alexandria, we will find a larger scale and much bigger monuments and much more important than the famous one in Jaras in Jordan and the famous one in Ephesus. And that's another project as well. You know, add that to the ancient lighthouse and the sunken antiquities of Alexandria, which is bringing ancient Alexandria back to life again. And it is there, just waiting to be discovered. So are there other uh, Greco-Roman monuments in other places in Egypt? Definitely, yes, you know, so, but it is, they don't have the character of the Greek and Roman art like in Alexandria. Yes. I, will, I will give you an example. So, when you travel in South Egypt, so yes. there is big temples like in Edfu and Komombo. Yes. You know, when you look at these temples, you know, it's pure ancient Egyptian design. But actually, it was built during the rule of the Greeks and Romans. And they mm. have some very, very, very minor influence from the Greek and Romans in the art of these temples. So. The Greeks and Romans, you know, they have two different ways of dealing with Egypt depends on if they are in Alexandria or outside of yes. Alexandria. So if they consider Alexandria their homeland. That's overlooking the Mediterranean Sea. So everything Greek, according to the Greek style that was made in Alexandria. But when they thought about the Nile Valley, so they knew that they cannot make this big impact by introducing their own culture to the Nile Valley. And that's why they built, when they built or sponsored temples or uh, let that happens, you know, by the ancient Egyptian priests under their guardian. So it was built in the ancient Egyptian style, not in their own style. So the, if the answer is yes, there is monuments along the Nile Valley built during the rule of the Greeks and Romans, but it takes the ancient Egyptian character, not the Greek character. On the other hand, in Alexandria, even when they were so proud of their Greek backgrounds, but also they wanted, they wanted to adapt the ancient Egyptian culture and the ancient Egyptian religion. And they built temples dedicated to the ancient Egyptian gods after making a mix between the Egyptian gods and the, the Greek and Roman, and Roman gods. And one of the best examples is Serabium and how Isis has been uh, as, associated in the Greek called to, be, to marry from the god Serabus and they built a Greek style temple for that. So uh, the Greek autonomy rulers, they were ruling Egypt or they have the biggest statues with Egyptian uh, style uh, dress. Cleopatra, which is still confusing, lots of people, because people think that she's an Egyptian. Actually, no, she's mm. descended from Ptolemy, from yes. the Greek and, and Macedonian, but she adapted the Egyptian culture. They decorated their streets and their squares with ancient Egyptian monuments, like what we are doing today. Obelisks and Sphinxes has been, has been translocated from ancient Egyptian sites in Luxor and in Tani and in, uh, uh, in San al Hagar and to decorate their city. Yes. Okay, uh, Egyptologist, uh, Mr. Samir Abbas, uh, thank you for being with us today. Yeah, glad to be with you as well.